This recording is presented by Hanson Reynolds Dickinson Kruger LLC, a litigation boutique firm based in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. To learn more about them, check out hrdclaw.com. Hello, I am Joshua Gilliland, attorney blogger on Bowtie Law. Thank you for joining me for my 2013 Case Law Year in Review. In my opinion, the top e-discovery issues for 2013 included understanding the scope of the duty to preserve, taxation of costs, and proportionality. Let's talk about each. 2013 had many litigation hold cases. One of my favorite was AMC Tech v. Cisco Systems. Uh, it's one of the two Judge Graywall opinions that I flagged for this year simply because it, it has fantastic analysis and is very detailed on examining litigation holds. Magistrate Judge Paul Graywall's AMC Tech v. Cisco Systems opinion opens with this wonderful passage. Ten years after Judge Shinlin woke up the legal world from its electronic discovery slumber in the Zubalik series, plenty of other courts now have weighed in on when the duty to preserve electronic evidence attaches. With varying degrees of sophistication, most parties have gotten the basic message. The duty begins at least no later than the day they are sued and told about it. Less understood is exactly what a party must do then and by when. So in this case, the plaintiff brought a motion for adverse inference instructions, basically wanting nuclear sanctions uh, going right for the jugular, uh, claiming that the defendant engaged in reckless destruction of documents by a key decision maker. Let's break down the basic facts of what happened to understand the judge's analysis. The defendant had a team negotiating a contract with the plaintiff. An employee not on the team contributed sales data for the lead negotiator's royalty payment schedule. The employee kept his sales data on his computer and email. The employee communicated by phone and email to the negotiator. The employee retired four days before the plaintiff filed the lawsuit. The employee's computer was wiped within the 30-day policy after he left the company. Neither party listed the employee as a custodian and the plaintiff sought information from the employee slightly over one year from the filing of the lawsuit. So the issue, had the duty to preserve already attached to the former employee's ESI prior to its deletion? And Judge Graywall has some wonderful quotes digging into this analysis. The scope of the duty to preserve is not limitless. A litigant has an obligation to preserve only evidence which it knows or reasonably should know is relevant to the action. This duty requires a party to identify, locate, maintain information that is relevant to specific, predictable, and identifiable litigation, which includes identifying key players. So what it boils down to is requiring a litigant to preserve all documents, regardless of their relevance, would cripple parties who are often involved in litigation or under the threat of litigation. The court found that the custodian was not a key player. Moreover, the data was not unique because the defendant produced its internal finance spreadsheets pertaining to the sales of the subject devices. The files were likely created by the employee and there were emails going back and forth with others, so it's not like the data had been lost. So the court held there was no prejudice to the plaintiff and that sanctions going for full liability would have been wholly inappropriate and thus the court denied the plaintiff's motion. Proportionality is often the redheaded stepchild in any e-discovery case. Now the proposed rules take proportionality front and center in a way that I don't agree with, I think could be problematic, but we'll see how things pan out there. But proportionality frequently is not argued. Instead, parties focus on uh, undue burden, claiming that ESI can't be produced because it's not in a reasonably usable form, when uh, that's not the right argument to be making. They really want to be making a proportionality argument. Well, we had a case that, again, that's a Judge Graywall opinion, that hit the proportionality issue, and it was in the Apple v. Samsung litigation 
tons of other opinions in this one. It is an epic one. But basically, Samsung sought additional information from Apple that would have required Apple to have done more work to produce it. And the court focused on proportionality and saying, no, they don't need to produce that information because you already have expert reports, there's other information there, but they'll be a stop from offering anything more. So it's a good, good opinion to, to look at and there's a lot in there. The court stated very nicely, the court is required to limit discovery if the burden or expense of the proposed discovery outweighs its likely benefit. And this is the essence of proportionality, an all too often ignored discovery principle. Based upon proportionality, the court limited discovery in the case and denied Samsung's motion. Which brings us to taxation of costs. Taxation of costs would be an excellent way to get parties to take proportionality seriously if a prevailing party were able to recover more in e-discovery costs from an opponent uh, when they are victorious in a case. So let's talk about what are the different types of costs that you can have when it comes to electronically stored information. And the answer is there are a bunch. You have everything from data identification, Data preservation could be anything from going out and forensically imaging hard drives on a bit-by-bit -bit level to doing targeted collections to uh, going after an email server. Processing. After the data is acquired, being able to then go, all right, now it has to be processed, which usually gets into deduplification, near dedupe, other data analytics to help distill the data down to a manageable size. You then get into issues with how to do production, so production media. Uh, if you are doing file conversion to static images, that can get in there. If you are scanning paper, doing optical character recognition, or if you've uh, converted ESI to TIFF, then you might want to OCR the redacted TIFFs to be able to get uh, searchable text from them. You can also have load file creation that then goes to the opposing side with a production. And also hosted review, uh, which could be a monthly cost, um, anywhere from, depending on the size of the case, a couple hundred dollars a month to tens of thousands, depending on how big the lawsuit is. Magistrate Judge Elizabeth Lopperette is one of the top e-discovery judges in the country, in my opinion. Judge Lopperette has a fantastic quote at the beginning of the Alzheimer's case about the taxation of cost statute. Enacted in 1853, well before the era of e-discovery, the statute is technically antiquated. Yet, unless and until Congress chooses to update it to address the new and rapidly evolving era of computer and cloud stored, processed, and produced data, Courts must do their best to select and apply the most appropriate analogy from the era of paper documents which the statute addressed. Being the history geek, I decided to look at the different antebellum technology prior to 1853. The biggest one would have been, in 1829, the typewriter. Photography rolled in in 1835. You had the Babbage differential engine in England in 1835. He had Morse code in 1838, which would be the most analogous to email and text messages that we have today. Those were some of the tech achievements prior to 1853. Now the eBay opinion, also from the Northern District of California, does a nice job of breaking down what you have to prove in a taxation of cost case. This includes a bill of costs must state separately and specifically each item's of taxable costs that are claimed. A party seeking costs must supply an affidavit explaining how the costs were necessarily incurred for the litigation and allowable by law and the appropriate documentation as well. With regard to individual costs, the burden is on the party seeking costs to establish the amount of costs that can be compensated and expenses to which it is entitled. A huge note for service providers. Merely supplying invoices that state this was done and it was necessary for the litigation is not enough. Courts need a little more substance. And in a lot of the 
taxation of cost opinions that I've looked at, they want a lot more to explain how it was necessary. I've even seen this in trial presentation cases because a lot of the trial presentation costs in federal court are not awarded. There are those that do award them, but you have to explain how it was necessary. And that's a big one because even in trial presentation, uh, courts will frequently say trial presentation was for the convenience of counsel. So you have to get past that. Another big one was the Anacora Tech litigation against Apple. Apple was the prevailing party. They were initially awarded in excess of $100,000 in hosting costs. Unfortunately, the amount was for all of their taxable cost was reduced to merely $20,000 uh, with $70,000 of that being for the hosting costs that were eliminated. So why no hosting costs? Costs incurred in hosting documents electronically and particularly in hosting costs that ex potentially exceed the amount space needed for the amount of data actually processed as here simply do not fit under section 1920's narrow limit of exemplification and the cost of making copies of any material where the copies are necessarily obtained for use in the case. Now, I don't agree with that. I think we can argue how more e-discovery costs should be compensated. I do believe Congress should update the statute because when we look at e-discovery and the fact that people are running around packing smartphones, that they have gigabytes with all over them, and when you look at the way litigation works and how ESI is preserved and then called down uh, and then ultimately before we can actually get to review and then productions, all of those steps go to making copies. And we cannot simply state a hosted platform, it's like a digital warehouse, because it's not. The digital warehouse is, is just not the right analogy. A warehouse does not have robots that can go out and search and find, analyze, learn from human beings and find what's relevant in a couple keystrokes. A dynamic litigation support database can. So I do believe then if we continue to argue in affidavits and spell out how using these tools was necessary for the litigation. If not, you'd be digging through baseball stadiums worth of data and saying, hey, no cost for this because unless you converted it to a TIF, that's the only reason that we're going to compensate you. Just isn't right. I think parties would take proportionality more seriously in how they draft requests and determine the scope of the litigation of a prevailing party were entitled to recover costs. I think that's wielding the hammer, or in this case the gavel, uh, at the other end of the spectrum to get parties to think big picture in advance. But I do think it's something that's necessary to help control the discovery costs by getting parties to think about the scope of discovery, tools that they can use to find information, and then recover costs for them. Because if we do live in a world where processing is not compensated, unless you convert ESI to TIFFs, thus driving up the cost of the litigation, we have a perverse incentive to go against Federal Rule of Civil Procedure Rule 1 requiring litigation be done in a just, speedy manner that keeps costs in mind. I think this is something that we need to look at into 2014. This recording was sponsored by Hanson, Reynolds, Dickerson & Kruger, a litigation boutique firm based in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. To learn more about them, check out hrdclaw.com.